take it away john yeah. since i was 12 man feels like forever ago how time flies uh well thank you everybody for uh joining me in track two for this talk we're going to be talking about containers hardening against escapes and yes the funk base which i have uh right here behind me so we'll be we'll be kind of bridging this together uh all at once so one of the things whenever i join one of these talks or you know show up to hear somebody talk i always ask myself okay well like who the heck are you what what can you tell me about this thing uh and what experience you have uh, behind that so a little quick thing about me is i've been doing software development for uh the last like five or so years uh and most of that time it's been focused on uh infrastructure platform deployments kubernetes uh i started off at pivotal working on cloud foundry which was a lot about vms and deploying your applications to vms and then that switched to uh kubernetes at vmware uh, and now i find myself at aws uh, working on a linux-based operating system called uh, an open source linux-based operating system called bottle rockets um and like we said i've been playing guitar and funk and uh bass and playing in bands since i was since i was just a kid so uh we'll we'll pull that all together here <laughs> uh towards the middle of the talk but uh first yeah i want to talk about containers and uh which might be a little strange for this audience my general focus has been more on the application side i guess more on developing software not so much the uh security side of things but uh when you work in linux and deep in the operating system especially deploying uh, uh opinionated operating systems like bottle rocket uh you really kind of think a lot you spend a lot of time thinking about security and uh, what kind of workloads people are deploying onto your systems and your platforms and how you can really create the most secure solution uh, for you know as many people as possible because there are bad actors out there as we all know um, and I hope this talk can not only be useful for software developers people deploying kubernetes uh, platform uh, operators and administrators but also for the red teams and the security teams out there who might be looking at these types of platforms that have containers on them and how you at your organization can hopefully uh, strengthen and harden against those threat actors out in the wild so our agenda for today uh, we got a ton to go through we're a little bit behind already but that's okay we're going to talk about containers what the heck even is a container because uh it's kind of bonkers to think about it's like inception so we're going to talk about what a container is uh we're gonna we're gonna look at what threat actors out in the wild are exploiting against containers and how they're looking at them how they're attacking them uh what we're gonna talk about what you can do what you can do to harden a little bit against containers and we're going to use the open source uh Linux-based operating system I work on, Ball Rocket, kind of as a, a case study in defense. And then we're going to tie that all up uh, with a little bit of funk base uh, towards the end here. So uh, before we can really get started and talk about what a container is, we have to kind of look at the landscape of what uh, software being deployed out in the wild, uh, what people are doing today. Um, there's cloud, people are still deploying on-premise, hardware, Kubernetes, Docker, Docker Swarm. Uh, so many things. Some of these clouds even have proprietary containerization platforms that they themselves are deploying, like one at AWS is ECS, which is their opinionated way of deploying containers that is a bit detached from the open source methods like Kubernetes. So people are deploying containers in all different kinds of ways on the cloud, um, on their metal hardware on premise. Um, and this is this is definitely a shift away from maybe how in the past even five ten years ago how people were deploying software uh this is definitely not uh the industry standard I will say people are still using VMs people are still deploying straight up onto metal hardware onto their base uh host OS Linux operating system or whatever but containers are continually being uh the most I guess I will say uh more and more popular as as we kind of go through time uh and it's it's interesting to think about you know where we've been and sort of why we've landed at containers today. So what is a container? Well, we all, we, we'll have our host OS, right? That might be like an Ubuntu or something that's actually running on top of your hardware uh, or on top of your cloud infrastructure. And that host OS is gonna have a kernel down here. And then on top of that is gonna be a container runtime. Uh, to, typically today, that's going to be container D. Uh, container D seems to have been the one that maybe has won the most. Uh, it originally had a lot of influence from the Docker ecosystem, and Docker is just 
loved and uh, beloved by many devs out in the wild, out in the world. So Container D kind of became a, a good standard for a lot of people in the open source to use as a container runtime. Then on top of that container runtime are individual containers. And an individual container is really just you know, the necessary software bundled up with some of its dependencies that then gets to utilize the underlying resources of your host operating system, the container runtime uh, resources, the kernel resources, even your host operating system standard libraries and binaries. Uh, it's all packaged up very nicely. And then on top of all this, you run your containers and it sort of prevents that whole problem of, well, it, it runs on my laptop. What are you talking about? It doesn't run in on our infrastructure or on prod or something. You can bundle all your stuff up in a container and it, quote unquote, TM should just work. This is a little different from how maybe traditional virtual machines worked or a traditional virtual machine. Sure, you would have your host OS, but the container in this case, or I guess the, the virtual machine, I should say, would go all the way down that stack. You're virtualizing everything all the way down the kernel uh, to really get uh, a, a very, very heavy lift, which creates amazing isolation. You have, you know, separation of concerns between different kernels uh, that you are are virtualizing, whereas a, a container is really only the most top level resources. So this is a shared kernel, uh, a shared uh, system resources that many containers may run on. So that's sort of containers in a very big nutshell. <laughs> uh, another thing to keep in mind, because we're using a shared kernel down here, is that containers, the way they work, are really just through underlying Linux uh, operating system paradigms. And I'm talking about control groups, uh, IDs and GID permissions, namespaces, uh, mounts. And it, it creates this, what I like to call soft sandbox, uh, oftentimes, sometimes a very soft sandbox. And you can use these kernel and uh, typical Linux paradigms, again, like C groups, namespaces, all that stuff, to do really interesting and useful things. Uh, and sometimes very bad and dangerous and often exploited things. So keep that in mind uh, as we go. Uh, let's actually take a quick look at a container. So here I am just on an Ubuntu VM. And uh, let's use Docker. And Docker is a very typical sort of developer tool for running and creating containers. Uh, but we can do the most simple thing, Docker run. And I'm going to give it the IT flag, which is for interactive. I'm just going to say RM to remove this container when we're all done with it. And I want to run BusyBox. And we're just going to say, OK, please run bin sh. Uh, oh, whoops. Not busy. We want BusyBox. There we go. So that launches my container, which again is all of this infrastructure uh, just bundled up inside of you know this uh, this shell here, I guess, and it's utilizing my underlying host's system resources, the kernel, some of the standard libraries, and all those things. And we can we can look at what's in here. Let me make this just a little bit wider, ls la, and we can see that this looks like a busy box. We can cat uh at cd and we could say os release os release in here well maybe that's not in busy box but you trust me this is busy box uh but really uh at the top level this has mounted some files using again the typical linux kernel sort of uh paradigms of c groups mounts namespaces all this stuff to give us really a busy box like environment and things so we can exit out of here to get back to the quote unquote host, uh, which is Ubuntu. So uh, you can almost think of it like Linux inception of just using all those, those typical paradigms. Uh, so next, I kind of want to transition into maybe how containers and a lot of threat actors are looking at containers out in the wild. And first thing I have to say is that uh, there are just some giants, giants of the industry that uh, we in the container space, uh, the Kubernetes space, really anybody shipping containers today, we're, we're standing on the backs of those giants. These people in the last, really even just the last few years, have made this space more secure and have started really poking at it hard to sort of tease out a lot of the very, very rough edges. Uh, this one from Felix is a, a legendary exploit that just uses a typical C group, uh, a typical C group feature called release agent to escape the container. And you're gonna hear me talking about container escapes uh, quite a bit in this talk. What a container escape is, is essentially 
you're you're going from that sandbox and you're kind of exploding out to the host system or you're gaining additional resources that should be sandboxed away uh, that only the host should have and there's lots of different ways to do that oftentimes through those typical linux paradigms that give you containers uh, so this one it used a a release agent that is a feature of c groups to essentially get uh to own the host we'll say uh so first they're running this docker container and this is the same thing busybox and they're running the ps command which should just give you those processes and typically inside of that container you would just see the 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 one uh process you're running which has been sh and then this ps command here and then the next thing they're running is that actual script that we just looked at uh which was very minified and i think they used uh some base 64 string to even get it into the container but now they're running ps using that that escape that container escape and we could see the root level system d the k thread d um all that stuff which should only be sandboxed or i guess should be sandboxed away from this container so essentially uh this shell that they ran this script with was able to escape out to the host system that's kind of container escapes 101 uh ian coldwater another legend uh, i'm sure many people have seen this there's an incredible defcon talk on this topic specifically using container escapes to break out to the actual mainframe from the cloud uh amazing talk definitely recommended but again like we're all standing on the backs of giants here uh containers today i will say are are just much better because of these people doing these these in, this incredible research to go and find uh these container escapes uh so now, everybody, please, please say it with me. Uh, containers are not a security boundary. <laughs> if if anybody, given the research that has been going on, uh, if there's anything that we've sort of discovered, uh, it's just that those sandboxes are poor security boundaries, uh, especially in uh, typical Linux fashion or, uh, I guess, uh, administrator fashion. Oftentimes, there's just little things, uh, little things left undone that can be massive exploits out in the wild for these threat actors. So containers are not a security boundary. That's if you come away from this talk with one thing, it's it's that uh, containers alone are not a security boundary. Uh, but I what, what I hope to kind of explore a little more in this talk is not only uh, containers as uh, platforms for your application, but how you on the underlying host operating system can make that platform a little better. Okay, so container escapes, we already talked a little bit about this, but uh, what's happening here uh, in my little diagram is we have uh, a container here, which is using sort of the typical Linux paradigms to escape out. And that one exploit we saw from Felix uh, was really interesting because it was just using a typical uh, feature of C groups. You can go to the Linux manual today still and read up on release agent, uh, which is a useful feature that C groups provide. Uh, thankfully, today that exploit is not not very usable because a lot of the container runtimes have made release agents very difficult to use as a uh, as a container escape mechanism. So uh, what's happening here is in this container we might have some threat actor uh, is in this container and they're using through the container runtime through the kernel um, all the way out to gain access to the host operating system uh, that's the most kind of basic version of a container escape to then own the host os uh, another sort of variant of this that i i'll call out explicitly just a little different uh, is what i call unnecessary escalations and what's happened here is we have three containers, the container runtime, the kernel, our host OS, uh, but then you'll also see this larger blue box, which I've labeled escalated, which is really a container that hasn't escaped out via the container runtime, via the kernel, but it's just kind of grown and bloated to the point that it's escalated its permissions to then own the entire host OS, but maybe hasn't necessarily escaped entirely out of the container. Uh, you'll see this sometimes, uh, and I cannot recommend, well, like I do not do this. <laughs> I recommend not doing this. Uh, don't run containers as privilege. That's, that's really one of the, the most basic things you can take away from this. So if I were to, uh, if I were, I were to run this similar command here, uh, and if I were to do privileged, if I can spell privileged, right? That's why I look at my notes, privileged, uh, busy box, bin SH we get in here. Uh, who am I? I'm root. Yes. And what? 
essentially I've given this Docker container and depending on which version of Docker you have on your host operating system, you may actually have the Capsys admin uh, capabilities permission uh, within this container, which essentially makes you the super user uh, at this point. So uh, running your containers as privileged, bad. Uh, also doing something like, uh, if I come back over here, you know, I'm not going to give it the privilege flag, but just saying, oh, please, sudo Docker run it. Uh, you're essentially doing the same thing by passing through root per permissions. So uh, that is an, a very easy way to escalate your containers to unnecessary levels of permission that then somebody who gains access to that container uh, could very, very easily exploit. Um, I'll also take uh, just a, a very quick second to mention, you know, what is kind of happening maybe inside of these containers. Uh, BusyBox, for example, is, um, and maybe BusyBox isn't a great example. Let's let's just do, let's do Ubuntu. Uh, Ubuntu has a ton of software, just a bunch of software. Let's just ls uh, the bin. Uh, that's that's a lot of software that's in this container uh, that ships within these container images. Uh, that's a lot of software that anybody, I guess, uh, gaining access via CVEs through these pieces of software could then uh, escalate your container unnecessarily or attempt to perform a container escape, so on and so forth. And what can make this really dangerous then is via some escalation or via an actual container escape is then the the threat actors then owning the host operating system could just install the backdoor etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, make it easier for themselves to then not have to go through the container runtime through the kernel which often do get patched uh, these things these things get patched frequently enough uh, even at the uh, container level itself where maybe later on if i let's see let's see if i exit out of here NFI Docker images, uh, let's grab for Ubuntu. This is the latest one with that SHA, and it was updated 11 days ago. So say there was some CVE inside of this specific Ubuntu container, they could release that, that gets consumed. And then uh, all of a sudden that specific CVE, a threat actor is going after might not be there anymore. But at that point, if they've owned the host OS through an escalation or through a container escape, there may be a backdoor, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that's, I guess, my short tangent on you know a lot of the software that ends up being on these containers that then can be exploited, that then can just own the entire operating system in the worst case scenario. All right, moving forward, uh, I kind of want to pivot quickly to a case study in defense, which is uh, Bottle Rocket, which is an open source Linux-based software uh, operating system that I work on and is really opinionated and optimized for running containers. And I think is a really good use case and study uh, for this crowd and what you can do to harden against these kind of attacks, against container escapes, and really make your environments and your platforms a lot better uh, against these uh, against these threat actors. Uh, but before we go too deep into that, and I've already touched on this a little bit, what makes a normal Linux distribution uh, from the perspective of a container, uh, or excuse me, from the perspective of a host operating system, okay, so this is the operating system that has the kernel, that has the container runtime, that then is running containers. Uh, what's wrong with that in that use case? Uh, well, as we've seen, uh, most Linux distributions just have a lot of bloat, unfortunately, uh, at least in the use case for uh, for running containers or for running your production distributions. Uh, really, all you need, you know, and I'll go back up here to, I guess this picture will do, really, for the most part, all you need when you are running a container platform is the kernel, the container runtime, and the necessary bits to, you know, fulfill those dependencies. Uh, you don't need a lot of the development tools. You don't need really much of what would come with Ubuntu, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, those full-on Linux distributions are great for doing more general purpose stuff. But if you're very opinionated on your platform for just running containers, it, it ends up being a lot of bloat. Uh, it's a lot of these extra services, uh, a lot of this extra just bits on your system that creates a giant attack surface area. Uh, and that's just more risk. Um, I'll also mention that because there's that, uh, I guess, greater attack surface area or greater amount of software that can be configured or changed, uh, normal Linux distributions that are not opinionated for containers 
can often become quote unquote pets, maybe what people would say in, in DevOps or uh, IT infrastructure. And these pets kind of become long lived in the, in the world of Kubernetes and I guess container platforms, it's sort of expected that you should be able to spin down and spin up new compute instances relatively easily without having to do a ton of configuration um, and to threat actors out in the wild that that's just great like they love that they want to leave these systems around as long as possible maybe they were able to perform a container escape and install a backdoor uh, the one thing that could maybe blow that away is a complete reinstall of uh, the host OS or just just completely rolling the infrastructure the compute infrastructure uh, but if it's a very highly opinionated and uh, configured uh, host OS, then that's that's bad news because uh, it'll it'll stick around for a very very long time. Uh, let's see the case study in defense. I'm going the wrong way. Containerized optimized uh, container optimized Linux distributions are different. Uh, what makes them different? Uh, oftentimes, these Linux distributions like Bottle Rocket are open source. And we really only ship the most essential software to run containers. And that's what I recommend as kind of the number one thing for a lot of people who are shipping uh, software onto container platforms is get rid of the bloat. Just, just get rid of it if you can, because it's additional software surface that uh, can be exploited in, in the long run. Uh, for example, one thing uh, that Bottle Rocket does is we just we don't have a shell period. There's no bash, there's no Z shell, there's no SH. Um, and we remove a lot of the other common user space programs that you don't uh, need to run containers, because oftentimes those are the targets during container escapes. Uh, oftentimes in a container escape, they're going to be targeting bash or SH or whatever to then execute additional programs, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, another good one, as an example, is having like the Python interpreter or a Ruby interpreter on your host operating system. That's also a frequent target to then execute additional code to install a backdoor, to own the system, et cetera, et cetera. So just not having a shell, just not having Python interpreters or Ruby interpreters, that just removes an entire swath of problems that you can avoid uh, that then help to, I guess, make the surface area around your containers, around the container runtime, around the kernel, uh, much, much better. Uh, another one that I will mention that is absolutely huge that I recommend really anybody running Linux in production should consider using is SE Linux, which uh, stands for uh, Security Enhanced Linux. Amazing. We all love that. We, we love security. We want to enhance our security, uh, especially for our production workloads. Uh, and it's a uh, SE Linux is a Linux kernel security module that you can install, open source, all that stuff. Bottle Rocket uses it. A lot of the container optimized uh, OSs use it. But it's it's a way to sort of create separation of concerns on the file system. You can do mandatory access controls via SE Linux uh, by labeling files and making sure that uh, you know different processes, different namespaces cannot access different files that have different labels. Uh, this whole talk could have just been about SE Linux. I don't want to boil it down to just like, oh, it's a way to, you know, make sure that this file can talk to that file, et cetera, et cetera. But SE Linux is absolutely huge. And I think uh, is is worth anybody's time to go and learn about, uh, discover how it works and how it can really harden the file system environment around uh, your container optimized, uh, I guess, platforms. Uh, another thing that I think can be really big, and this is also something that Bottle Rocket does, is we do not have a, uh, a non-persistent file systems, non-persistent file systems, excuse me. And what that means is that on boot, on reboot, uh, we have basically a snapshot of the disk uh, that is shipped that then uh, is, is rebooted into. So, well, what does that mean? That means that anything that is changed on the root partition does not persist on reboots. And, and that is just absolutely huge, uh, again, for these kind of hardening around security for a lot of these systems. So say somebody was somehow able to execute a container escape and drop something onto the file system, and then you know your systems maybe have a nightly, nightly role of uh, your infrastructure. Well, that role would then just reboot into the non-persistent file system, which does not have that threat actor's binary or whatever things that they tried to drop on there, maybe even a backdoor or something. Uh, it just reboots into that non-persistent file system, which gives you kind of the 
I guess, really only files that you would expect on the system. Uh, one thing you might be asking is like, well, how the heck do I run workloads on on here? Um, you do you are able to uh, mount and boot, and this is kind of getting into the weeds about how you manage and uh, I guess facilitate and operate your mounts in your container platforms. But there are uh, different mounts that you can have for workloads, for, I guess, quote unquote, user space, that would be the container stuff. Uh, but the root file system uh, being non-persistent is huge and can be a really big thing. All right, we're trucking along very quickly. Uh, and just like containers, as is where my big pun comes in to transition to the bass guitar, uh, just like containers, uh, the bass guitar, especially in funk music, uh, can escape to the foreground of a song. I know, but very funny. Uh, so yeah, I, I I love playing guitar. I love playing funk guitar, uh, funk bass, uh, and the bass, uh, especially into the '60s and '70s, much like a container, can kind of rise to the surface of the song. Where typically we think about the bass as a more background instrument, uh, it can really escape to the forefront of that song, uh, regardless of it being thought of as more of like a rhythm or kind of behind the scenes, just keeping the low notes sort of thing. It can really become the forefront, become the melody and and really drive the rhythm. Uh, so let me grab my bass. And let's see, let's, everybody can see this, here we go. Sweet. Uh, the anatomy of a bass, that's first what we got to talk about. What What is this crazy thing? Uh, a bass is, is pretty similar to a, a normal electric guitar. Uh, most basses have four strings, but you will see five string, six string, eight string basses, all kinds of crazy stuff. But mm -hmm. typically on a traditional bass, you'll see four strings and they're, they're tuned the same as a guitar, the bottom four strings of a guitar, uh, but down an octave. Uh, the head, the head of the bass is very similar to a guitar, just a bit chunkier because these strings are, are definitely bigger, uh, going down an octave. And then the body the body here uh, with our, our knobs to uh, have volume and tone. Uh, and then typically when you play the bass, you know, you're doing kind of a kind of a, a walking with your strings, kind of a right. And that uh, that gives you sort of a lot of this traditional like. Right, I'm just kind of walking it out with my fingers. So that's that's the real rough <laughs> one on one to the anatomy of a bass. Uh, and I want to explore uh, some of these people through history from really a lot of kind of the 60s and 70s who innovated around the base. And much like <laughs> the innovative uh, hackers and container uh, container security folks of today, they really made the base uh, a lot, lot more prominent and kind of forced it to rise up and become more of a prominent figure in the music of their day. So uh, the first person I wanna talk about is Larry Graham, who is from Sly and the Family Stone, uh, has done a lot of his own solo stuff as well, but he is typically credited as being the inventor of slap bass. So what I what I just showed you was kind of the walking, just, you know, do, 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 right? And that, that gives you just kind of a, that just gives you kind of a normal sort of, I guess, thudding kind of tone. But the slap bass is is a lot more percussive, and it gave a lot of funk music that really what we would call funk music today kind of that percussive sort of uh, mix of melody and rhythm today. So what that what that really sounds like is you're literally just hitting a string with your thumb. So that will be uh, just like, and then the other side of your hand, the these two fingers really. You're kind of doing a pluck as well, so that would sound like, and it 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 it's a lot grittier. It's a lot more, you know, kind of uh, rhythmic in its nature. So, uh, this is one of their songs, "Line the Family Stones." And normal bass, how that would sound would just be, which is not as punchy, not as rhythmic, I guess. Uh, so the slap bass was huge in helping to define in the 60s and 70s what funk music felt like, uh, what really defined it, not only from a melodic and rhythmic standpoint, but uh, it was very unique in its in its in its feel and its uh, I don't know, just like its groove. You know what I mean? Uh, a lot of times when you start talking about funk music, it's hard to not start kind of 
getting into this like esoteric like it just it just feels different man right and a lot of that i i believe comes from the bass uh even just playing that song like yeah oh really uh i could turn it up on my how's that is that better all right cool uh it's probably also i'll say if your headphones <laughs> cannot register super low it might be that as well all right we'll try that uh what, what was i saying so the uh yeah the bass really started to help define kind of that esoteric like what does it feel like what is what is the groove feeling like uh and a lot of that was was bass right <laughs> And that a lot of that, yeah, was just kind of the feel of the slap bass. So we can thank Larry Graham for a lot of that today. Uh, you even hear that um, in in some current music, like uh, a lot of people might be familiar with Silk Sonic, who had an album from 2021, and some of their music featured Bootsy Collins, who was another one of these innovators of early funk music in the 60s and 70s. And they brought Bootsy Collins on to do a bunch of the bass in it. And it's it's got all this slap in it. And it's it's it feels very funky. And I think what gave that album that that very unique kind of 70s funk vibe, right? All right. Uh the next person I want to talk about is Herbie Hancock and the Headhunters, specifically Paul Jackson. Uh, this is from 1976. And Herbie Hancock is one of those kind of really interesting innovators of just not only jazz music, but uh, sort of this this weird thing they started doing with like psychedelic jazz and what people start calling acid jazz. Uh, and a very, very, very big part of that was the bass. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with this song. And that that was all that was all bass driving that not only rhythmically, uh, but melodically as well. And you can really almost start to feel in that song, kind of like I was talking about the feel of that last one, you can start to feel the rhythm kicking in. You can start to feel like, oh yeah, the drums would come in like, right? And uh, the the bass is, is instrumental in having that kind of move forward and uh, rhythm, rhythmically drive the song very hard. Uh, so yeah, we can thank Paul Jackson for that as well. Another just massive innovator. Um, I think he's actually playing not this bass specifically, but that is a similar bass, uh, which is the jazz, the jazz precision uh, from Fender. Uh, Fender, we'll take a quick, quick detour to talk about Fender. Um, they were very big as well, working with instrumentalists in the 60s and 70s, coming up with with uh, basses and instruments that they wanted to play, that they wanted to, uh, you know, innovate on. So Fender, I think, would also be a big credit in not only, you know, working with artists, but also creating instruments that they, you know, they felt they felt they could use to to make the music that they wanted to make. So uh, shout out to Fender, shout out to Paul Jackson and the Headhunters. Uh, huge, huge for sure. Uh, we're going to fast forward like another 20, 30 years or something. Uh, and one of my favorite bands growing up when I was, you know, in high school and stuff, I'm kind of dating myself. This picture is from 2019, but MXPX is definitely a kind of an, an older, more hardcore punk band. And really, when you think about hardcore punk and I guess even the pop punks of the day, like Blink-182 and stuff, uh, they themselves were influenced very heavily as well by these styles of music, by bringing the bass forward. And uh, a lot of what you would think of in, in punk music might just be kind of a more driving, like, right? Just something that's kind of do, 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 just kind of an over and over and over drive of, of these things. But even artists, one of my favorite artists like MXPX would do things like, which is a which is a super super fun song um but has that kind of jazzy almost bebop kind of feel uh of a walk uh they could have just done something really boring like and then brought some drums in and you know brought the vocals in and stuff that's just so boring uh they wanted to do something more interesting and you know reaching into the deep history of funk and jazz music uh they they created a fun Oops, there we go. And that's like a really fun line. 
you know, that that kind of brings the bass to the forefront uh, and to bring the pun back all the way back around. <laughs> uh, it, the, the bass escapes from the background, escapes like a container would escape. Um, yeah, those were really the three songs I prepared <laughs> as far as bass songs. But uh, yeah, love playing the bass. Uh, anybody who who th who thinks about picking up the bass uh, definitely know that it's not a background instrument. It's definitely one that can you know explode to the forefront of a song, drive it rhythmically, drive it uh, uh, melodically as well. So yeah, uh, you too should learn the bass. Uh, happy to take a few questions and uh, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, John. We do sure. have some questions for you. Um, number one, uh, what examples do we have of real world incidents that relied on a container escape? Um, we know about misconfiguration issues like exposed admin panels, mm -hmm. but uh, real world. That's a that's a good that's a good question. Um, I don't know if there's been that an, that amount of granular data around like okay this was a container escape that used you know this container's uh, guest operating system that then escaped to this host operating system that was using Kubernetes or something. But uh, there's there is some interesting data from the uh, Cloud Native uh, Security Foundation which talks about like you know different CVEs that have been uh, patched or um, I don't know if they keep track of data around like actual exploitations or executions of those exploitations. Uh, but I think the the talk from the talk from Ian Coldwater, I think is is really good uh, in that it it discusses how they were able to escape from the container to the host operating system and then also deeper into the substrate of, I think it was on GCP into kind of their, their uh, infrastructure substrate onto the mainframe. Uh, and I, I think the title of that talk is is using container escapes to get to the mainframe or something. Uh, I think it was DEF CON 29. Great talk. But that's a really, really good use case of something that is like massively bad <laughs> and could just be like an entire cloud's infrastructure that was, was exploited through that research. Awesome. Thank you. Um, next question. What's current state of the art for process monitoring within containers? Um, the questioner asks about uh, looking at Audit D a couple of years ago, but it didn't really seem to do the job. Um, what have you heard or learned about? Yeah, yeah. There's uh, there's a bunch of I mean compliance and reporting tooling that um, I know Graf uh, Grafana has some. Um, I think that they, I think they have an integration with some of the stuff that, uh, it's not Prometheus, it's another tooling, but, um, I'll also point, point people to the cloud native computing foundation, which, you know, they kind of help make recommendations or I guess incubate projects. And they, they have an entire, entire category of incubating projects that, um, kind of fulfill a lot of those requirements as far as, uh, logging and auditing and, uh, ensuring compliance, um, yeah, so I would I would point people there, but yeah, I know I know Grafana has some. Uh, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, I'll give Grafana a shout out because <laughs> I know they have one. But yeah, uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation has some for sure. That's great. Um, I see someone uh, went ahead and posted the link to that talk into Slack. Um, another question, really quick one: Are you using Bog Rocket as the host OS or as the VM instance? Uh, that's a great that's a great question. So Bottle Rocket works as the host operating system to then uh, give you obviously the kernel and then the container runtime and then you're gonna have containers on top of that. Uh, for the Kubernetes, uh, I guess use case, uh, that container runtime would be working through the kubelet, which then you're gonna get containers on top of that, which um, which then can be orchestrated from across many of your compute nodes. Uh, but yeah. Bottle Rocket typically is is your actual host's operating system. So mm -hmm. the, the, the furthest one down, I guess, in the stack. Okay. Um, we've had a little bit of feedback on this in Slack, but I'd also like your take on this. Um, do you have suggestions about good ways to learn how to use SE Linux effectively? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Uh I wish <laughs> I wish I had more time to talk about SE Linux because I, I really kind of breezed by it. But um, Red Hat definitely has some really really good material on on SE Linux. Um, just some good like kind of 
I guess, tutorial-ish type material. Um, they they were very heavily in the development of it, but it's it's all open source and uh, free Linux software um, since it, I guess, plugs right into as a kernel module. But uh, the Red Hat material is really good. Uh, I think... I think there was something in Linux Weekly News. I can try and post it in Slack that uh, that was really good for bootstrapping as well. But it SE Linux has definitely become one of those things that, like, I think I think in the next few years would just be a, a standard across like production infrastructure. Um, it really does a great job at kind of giving you a separation of concerns on the file system. So be it you're running containers, be it maybe you're running virtual machines or something, it'll it'll give you that full on kind of separation concerns if you guys it label uh it's labels so yeah i'll i'll post something in slack or um try to find something that i read on on linux weekly news because that was really good okay and one final question to round us out uh what is your favorite jocko tune oh that's a good question uh i don't know if i can i don't know if i can pick one i'll punt and i'm not sure <laughs> all right well, thank you very much, John. Um, appreciated learning about containers and learning about base. Yeah, of course. Well, thanks for thanks for having me. Appreciate it.